This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, I have another extra special guest. Assis Shah is co-head and CIO of public investing at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. He helps to oversee $2.3 trillion of assets at GSAM. Um, He has a fascinating background, both in technology and innovation, in equity, and perhaps most importantly, in credit and fixed income. Uh, He just has a unique set of experiences that have placed him in the right place at the right time, doing the exact right job. There aren't a lot of people in the world of asset management who have such a broad and round set of skills and experiences that have led him to this position. Um, Fascinating background, Alliance Bernstein and Lehman Brothers, as well as a couple of uh, Silicon Valley tech startups. Uh, I found his discussion about what went on during the financial crisis at Lehman Brothers and the sort of leadership that you didn't really hear about at the time. You you only saw the criticism of um, the C-suite executives who at various companies had, had kind of run uh, into problems. But underneath that is just a whole layer of people doing their jobs for themselves, their clients, their staff. And, and I just found that conversation to be fascinating. And I think you will also. So with no further ado, my discussion with Goldman Sachs Asset Managers, CIO Assis Shah. Thanks so much for having me. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your background. You come out of the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania with a BS in economics. What was the career plan? Look, I, I had no plan. I <laughs> This whole world was completely new to me. But I knew two things. First, I knew I loved markets. You know, I'd worked for Jeremy Siegel as a research assistant when I was at Wharton. And that really kind of embedded in me this love of macro and love of markets. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was I knew I didn't want to go into an investment banking track. I wanted something where I could work on interesting problems that would allow me to cast the career that I wanted um, without being kind of shooed into like this, you know, analyst, associate, kind of fixed career track. And you have some really interesting and unusual experience, both both as a trader and, and working as an entrepreneur, innovator, and, and startup. Let, let's talk about some of that. First, you were a, a trader at a hedge fund that was funded by Soros. Is it Blue Border? What's the name of the fund? Blue Border Partners. Uh huh. And and what was it like being a, a trader in that space? Yeah. So so I I joined that organization right after nine eleven. Uh huh. Um. And right after I'd come back to New York City, and you know it was a fantastic experience. The markets were all over the place, but it was a very small organization. There were you know, five or six of us, and we were spread all across the world. Um, it was nice because I got to work with Greg Coffey, who was oh, one, really? one of the partners there, and obviously has gone on to fantastic things. But I, I basically sat in a cubicle by myself <laughs> trying to come up with investment ideas and realized that that is not my best best place my performance wasn't the best and but but I learned a lot from that experience in knowing that I'm very much a team player and I work well in kind of mid to larger size organizations and you said you came back to New York I know you were uh, on the west coast working in a few startups Tell us a little bit about Level 3 and some of the other work you did out West. Yeah, so you know, you go back to the late 90s and the internet was all the rage. Um, I had a brother-in-law that had joined a company called Level 3 Communications that was literally building out the internet. He calls me one day. He's like, hey, we're looking for people. They have the following profile. I think you meet it. Come visit and meet with our folks. And I was like, this is my opportunity to really build out my skill sets, right? I I was a uh, head of a prop trading desk at Bankers Trust. I had a series of skill sets, but I was really interested in kind of going to business school, but without going to business school. I saw this as a fantastic opportunity to do that. So I go out, I learn the telecom industry, I work 120 hour weeks, um, helping 
level three, raise money, um, build out its business plan. And I learned a tremendous amount of time uh, uh, about business, about startups, about innovation in that period of time. And and what was the other startup that you helped to uh, co-found? Yeah, so, so once I left there, you know, I left there because I saw that the industry needed f- greater level of transparency and financial discipline. So I went on to found uh, Sage Logics, which was really meant to be it was a software ASP in the telecom space focused on telecom providers. And my thesis was, hey, if these organizations don't get their head around their cost structure, that they're all going to go bankrupt. Reality is, I should have come back to Wall Street and expressed that view in <laughs> in two thousand and one because right. that's essentially what ended up happening. Right, betting against stocks instead of trying to advise people, hey, you better get your act together, or else there's going to be trouble. Exactly. Um, so you come back to to New York. Uh, eventually, you get into credit and asset management at Alliance Bernstein. Um, I'm going to hold off your Lehman experience for a few moments because sure. I know we can spend a lot of time talking about that. So uh, eventually you go to Lehman, then to Alliance Bernstein. Tell us what you did at Alliance um, where you were CFO and portfolio manager. Yeah, so so I, I was brought in by Doug Peoples and Peter Krauss to lead the credit organization. And I think that, you know, when I think back to that period of time, what they were trying to accomplish is that they had really strong credit capabilities, but they needed to unify a team and they needed to build an investment process that was going to be scalable. They had some of the most talented portfolio managers and kind of investors in the world. They really understood um, how to construct portfolios, which were things that I learned from those portfolio managers, portfolio managers like Gershon Distenfeld that leads income at AB today. Um, What I brought to the table was an ability to kind of bring the team together to operate to singular set of incentives, i.e. delivering performance, right? Not being distracted by things. And to be able to do that at scale. Um, I brought the hedge fund skills, the derivative skills that you kind of learn in operating in hedge fund and prop desks um, to that traditional asset management. And what I learned was how do you construct portfolios in a way where you can stick with your bets over long haul, but at size, right? Where you are the market. And so you don't have the ability to kind of increase risk, decrease risk, but rather that you are building your portfolio so you can stick with the risks that you think make sense over time. What you're describing sounds like a set of challenges that faces any large asset manager. The ability to scale, the ability to make sure all members of the team are pulling in the same direction, to make sure the incentives are aligned properly. How universal are the things that you did at Alliance Bernstein Credit to any large asset manager. Look, th- those are absolutely critical uh, elements. And it's amazing how, as the asset management industry has consolidated and these investment organizations have grown, how difficult it is for those organizations to pivot into those things. Why, why is that? Is it just legacy systems that people can't get past the sunk costs or is it something no, more? I, I, I think it ends up being cultural. I think that investing requires focus and very similar to a lot of organizations, you are built around these teams that are small and agile, right? Because you have to adapt to the market. Sure. But how do you pull those teams together into larger organizations to be able to do bigger things. And I think, you know, that's where the innovation experience that I had within technology and within software really came in handy because I not only understood markets and investment process, but I was able to take kind of how do you invest at scale? How do you bring technology as a force multiplier for your investors so that your investors can focus, they can be in, uh, and operate in smaller org- uh, teams, make decisions quickly, but at the same time that you can build large scale customization on behalf of your clients. So let's talk about a little innovation. You found AB Labs in 2015. Tell us a little bit about what AB Labs did and and what it allowed you to express within that project. Yeah, so I, I, when I go back to that period of time, I think there were th- four of us at Alliance Bernstein that realized 
um, there was something materially changing in the market, which was fintech was really changing and accelerating the changes um, within the broader asset management ecosystem. And so myself and you know Vicky Walia, Matt Bass, Carl Sproul's CTO, um, decided that in order to get our organization ready, that we needed to build that muscle, not just at the top down as an initiative, but actually at a, as a bottom up engagement tool for the organization. And so we tackled topics like robo-advisors, crypto, blockchain within that construct as a way to educate the organization much more rapidly and get people leaning forward into innovation. So was this a pure research group or was this a bit of a venture fund that focused on fintech. So it ended up leading to both, <laughs> right? It ended up leading to venture investments, but in large part, most of that effort was a really around building organizational readiness to innovate. And uh, you know, a lot of the things that spun out of that effort really kind of continue to impact that organization today in terms of the forward lean when it comes to innovation and the overall operating stack that allows them to um, to be able to, again, allow the portfolio managers to focus on markets um, and yet to be able to deliver uh, scalable solutions. You mentioned culture earlier. How important is it for an organization to have the right mindset, to lean into technology, to be aware of the fact that, hey, if you're not cannibalizing yourself, someone else will. Look, I, I think that culture defines success in investing, um, and particularly in investing in organizations, that you have to set an investment culture where your investors, first of all, are very aligned to delivering performance and the type of performance that's going to end up making your clients happy. I think that you need to have a culture where people collaborate. Um, if you don't, it's going to be really tough to have scaled performance, right? You can succeed in one area, but you're only going to be as good and have as much insight as that any one you know, small group, which is going to limit your success if you try to do other things. And and the final point, you know, exactly the one you brought up, which which is around innovation. Um, the world is moving really rapidly. The way you do research, the way you put together portfolios, the way you execute in the market is changing. And frankly, what end advisors want right, for their clients and what we as an asset manager have to deliver is changing very rapidly. Everyone wants mass customization, but delivered with the quality of institutional asset management. And I think it really requires innovation um, and technology in order to do that well. And, and frankly, that's why I joined Goldman Sachs, because I felt that you needed the scale resources of that come with a firm like Goldman Sachs in the analytics, in the ability to really invest in technology and in data if we were going to succeed in going to market in the RIA and wirehouse community and delivering to you know institutional quality portfolios um, that really meet the individual needs of every individual um, at you know minimum sizes of a hundred thousand hmm. dollars. It's interesting because in the past, what you're describing has been somewhat mutually exclusive. It's very hard to deliver. Um, institutional size asset management and mass customization together, I'm going to assume innovation and technology is what bridges that gap. Absolutely. So, so let's talk about a couple of related quotes that you have um, that caught my, uh, my ear uh, because it relates to where we are in this market adoption cycle of technology and and how the world is changing, quote, as a long-term investor, all you do is worry. But it's not about what you're thinking. It's about how you react. Explain. Yeah, so so I think that um, the most successful investors, um, the way they invest is they decide what works, what they believe works over time. And they're simply trying to stick with it. And so what is the worry about? The worry is about... Um, first of all, 
is that thing that I believe works over the long haul, to what extent is it wrong? Because where I'm really going to underperform is if I get a long-term trend wrong. And so you should be constantly challenging your core thesis. But inside of that, you know, I think it's really critical to be humble and to understand that that core thesis, you have to stick with it over time. And so the other aspect of this is, okay, what can you do to make it so that you stick with your course core thesis. Um, because if you have an environment where your core thesis, whatever it is you do, whether it's investing in growth, um, investing in, in companies that um, are lined up with a tr long term trend like technology, um, you know, you're going to be challenged, right? And so the question is, how do you construct portfolios? Um, how do you look out for the challenges that are going to cause your clients to fire you? Right. Um, and if you can tilt out of whatever it is that works over the long haul in those periods of time when maybe it's gotten crowded or overextended, you're going to be much more successful in capturing those periods of um, when the opportunity is the best, i.e. buying low and selling high rather than you know, having to sell low because your investors essentially have lost patience. Mm -hmm. So, so you raise a really interesting point about constantly having to reevaluate your underlying thesis, but it it makes me think of one of the biggest challenges there, which is how can you tell whether or not an underlying thesis is no longer true, or if you're just in a period of hey, this style is out of favor and. It, this is what happens on a regular basis. Value underperforms growth for a while or international underperforms domestic. How can you identify when you have a giant secular shift versus simply, hey, this has fallen out of favor these days? Yeah, so so that that's where doing research and developing an investment process are absolutely critical, right? Your investment process makes it so that when – you know, there might be a challenge that use other tools like momentum, like, you know, um, risk analytics to be able to like not question whether your thesis is out there, but actually reduce your risk before the market has questioned your thesis. Right. So nothing may have changed, but if the market is changing the pricing of that risk, right, it matters to your portfolio. So I think that first point is really critical, which is you need to have things that actually diversify you out of that long term, right? And they have to kind of take place before you've already lost money. Um, I think that the second thing is that you want to be doing the research and developing your process so that when your style has gone out of favor, that you know when to double down. Right, mm -hmm. that you know when to lean in and you have confidence to do it. And so that's a lot of what investment process design is, is how do you stick with the long-term bets? How do you tilt out and tilt in um, rather than you know, being kind of and reacting, being backfooted or reacting, that you're actually front-footed and you're able to kind of you know, shallow out the drawdowns and lean into the opportunities. So we've mostly been talking about things that apply to equities, things like momentum and value and growth. Let's talk about the other side of uh, a balanced portfolio, which is fixed income. How are you thinking about fixed income, be it corporates, treasury, or even tips, in what's been a pretty wild environment where the central bank has raised rates 525 basis points in about 18 months. How do you how do you process that? Yeah, so from a long-term perspective, this seems trite to say, but fixed income is about income, mm -hmm. right? And so the starting point is evaluating income, evaluating the likelihood that you actually can capture and hang on to the income because a lot of the credit instruments, if you have losses in your portfolio, that gives up the income, right? right? So starting point is income. Um, shape of curves matter. Mm -hmm. So spread curves historically, most of the time are steep. Um, interest rate curves, most of the time are steep. That happens not to be the case today. Right. What have we been inverted for two years? Just about almost. That, right. That's a pretty unusual set of circumstances, Very, at least in the modern era. Well, it's 
Also very, very unusual to see an inversion like this and not see a material slowdown in growth, right? Part of the reason why 12 months ago, people were forecasting with high probability that we'd be in a recession is because historically yield curve inversions really kind of announce that we're slowing down. Pre pretty good track record historically yeah. too. Um, I, I think that what's changed this time around is that you know real rates and nominal rates are high enough that they are slowing the economy down, but there's enough offsetting fiscal um, impulse within the U.S. economy, at least, that you know, you have growth continuing on. And so you have this interesting situation where inflation has been coming down, right? It may be not in a straight line. And certainly the la last couple of data points that we've had haven't, um, haven't really pleased the market in terms of the Fed being able to ease aggressively. But inflation has come down from its peak. Um, but growth continues. And I think that, you know, for for fixed income and in the income piece, um, you're better off in the front end. Now, if you look at value mm -hmm. in the curve and from a longer term perspective, look at what are the real rates relative to the real ability for the economy to grow, we're pretty attractive here, right? And the one thing we do know is that if growth does slow down in a way that like cascades into inflation, that bonds are going to do their job on the price side, which is they're going to diversify the equities that you hold. So falling inflation, still robust growth, and a decent yield on fixed income, uh, dare I use the word Goldilocks? Is this a pretty decent investing environment for relative to what we've seen over the past few years? Look, certainly on a year-to-date basis, if you look at your full portfolio, you've done pretty well, right? And that that really comes from the starting point, which is, you know, you have high nominal yields and you have economic growth and earnings growth on the equity side. Those two things are working together to generate a pretty good return in absolute terms. Huh, really quite, quite intriguing. So let's talk a little bit about your experience in the 2000s. Um, you came back to New York from the West Coast, and uh, you ended up at Lehman Brothers working on the credit strategy side. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to Lehman and what were your experiences like? Yeah, so um, I was a client of Lehman's uh, back in the early 90s, mid-90s, and so I had a lot of relationships there. And, you know, I had always loved fixed income as an investor. Unfortunately, fixed income became a lot less interesting in the later 90s. And so my team had really pivoted um, towards more equity strategies. And so um, when I, I was coming back, um, looking to get back into Wall Street from the technology and, and telecom space, um, Lehman was one of the phone calls I made. Tom Corcoran and Rick Reeder were people that knew me that had done business with me. And they said, hey, you know, what would you think about trading prop um, within Lehman Brothers? And, and I said, look, I haven't traded fixed income markets for, you know, coming up on five or six years. I don't think I should be managing capital right away. Um, but there was a real change going on within fixed income markets and specifically within credit markets, which is derivatives were coming into the space, mm -hmm. hedge funds were coming into the space. And so when you looked inside of the credit business at Lehman, the people that understood derivatives didn't understand credit. The people that understood credit didn't understand derivatives. And I happened to be one of the rare individuals that had grown up understanding credit, understanding derivatives, and understanding what a hedge fund, fund, what types of trades a hedge fund would be interested in doing. And so I came into the role, you know, with ostensibly the, the title of hedge fund strategist. Mm -hmm. And my, my job, my day job was really to work with the traders and the salespeople to come up with trade ideas for hedge funds. And so all I was doing was looking for ideas for myself right. that I found was interesting. And so that cascaded into people realize that, wait, this, this person understands credit, they understand derivatives, they understand um, these alternative strategies. And so I was 
you know, able to cascade that into running all of credit strategy, including kind of some of the prop um, prop research analysts that work within the organization. So, so let's set the stage a little bit. What what year do you come back to Lehman Brothers? Two thousand three. So it's post dot com implosion. Yep. Technology had fallen about eighty percent. If you look at the Nasdaq peak to trough, suddenly had become very attractive as the uh, Gulf War was beginning. What was that era like at Lehman Brothers in the early to mid 2000s? What what were you seeing and and what was the general energy like at that shop? Because I remember that trading floor as being just a monster sort of noise machine. Yeah, it was super high energy. This was the world of fixed income, right? Fixed income was booming. Um, the growth of structured credit of... Um, you know, mortgage credit, you know, was really kind of expanding the opportunity set. And every, the, there was a lot of credit being borrowed, right? Um, you know, to, to fund companies in the aftermath of um, 2000, 2002, that credit cycle, there were secondary opportunities from a distressed debt perspective. Um, it, it was just a high energy, rapid growth area. And so it was exciting to be there watching what was going on, helping to influence what was going on in terms of product creation and, and client education. I don't know if people realize 03 was still fairly early days of the ramp up of mortgage backed securitization. It had already been underway, but no way near the numbers we saw a few years later. What was that experience like watching this machine start to develop some momentum? Yeah, so so I I didn't directly watch the mortgage side of the business. I was on the corporate credit side of the mm -hmm. business. Um but you know, without question, the overall fixed income franchise was growing. And so we were able to cascade that into, you know, growth in our franchise and product innovation that really was serving our clients, which were largely um, both hedge funds and asset managers. So you were at Lehman during what probably was the five most exciting years in the company's 180 year history. Any stories stand out from that period? I would imagine you saw a lot of things happen there. Yeah, so I I, I tell you that um, you know the number of stories I have around uh, the fall of Lehman in two thousand eight. You know, th that was a period of time that, you know, obviously a very difficult time for the economy, for mm -hmm. everyone involved at the human level. But, you know, it was a tremendous leadership um, kind of experience because you really got to understand what you were made of, um, who you were about, and you got to develop a reputation. Um, you know, from my standpoint, you know, the story that stands out to me. So, you know, I had taken over from Rick Reader, um, doing the weekly credit call. So on a weekly basis, myself, um, you know, or uh, Eric Felder would do a call really surveilling from a macro perspective what was going on in markets and specifically credit markets. And so Lehman had failed on Sunday, right? Gone bankrupt, had gone in, taken my box in and cleaned up my desk. Literally like walking out with the banker box full of personal items. And, and being interviewed on, you know, on the outside by the media. But Monday morning, I walk in, I'm wearing a suit, ready to go and saying, and we're all standing around not knowing what to do. Po and post bankruptcy. Post file. bankruptcy, we don't know if we have salaries or hedge or, or health care for that matter. Um, and my team and I are sitting down. Um, everyone's kind of you know at different stages of what do we do, and we have this call that we do every week that is the following mor morning and so my wait just let me make sure yeah. i understand this so sunday lehman files yeah monday it's front page news all over the world and what time is your call 8 a.m it's uh it was at 7 45 a.m uh, so you have to get on the horn and speak to the entire um sales team and and bond and, and all of our clients right and i i sat with my team and I said, look, um, I want to do this because it's the right thing to do. And I don't know what our outcome is here, but 
you know, I don't want to go out this way. I want to go out with everyone knowing that the last thing we did in our jobs was we tried to serve them. Right. And, and so, you know, one of my team members, uh, a guy by the name of Krishna Hegde, um, and I worked till probably 1130 or midnight that night. Um, put together the presentation the next morning. That's till Sunday night, midnight. Uh, sorry, that's Monday night, midnight. Um, call goes on on Tuesday. Um, we show up on Tuesday morning, and we're going over the internal hoot, and there's you know probably 300, 400 clients dialed in, however many more. Right. And everyone looks up, and they're like, we can't believe these guys are still going. Right. And, um, and in fact, I think it was about an hour later that over the hoot, um, the CEO of, of Barclays comes over and, you know, announces that Barclays is buying Lehman Brothers, right? right the U.S. operations. And someone in equities has the, you know, hilarity of playing God save the queen <laughs> over the who. But the number of emails that I got around um, from clients saying, wow, you know, we've always respected your work, but to go on and to do your job in servicing your clients um, on this day of all days is like hats off to you. And so I, I think that like that was one of the things that I think it's lost in all the stories and the, the media is that you had a group of people here that really did care about clients um, and went out of their way, even when the chips were down, to keep doing their jobs. So Barclays takes over Lehman U.S., with I, I think there was a Fed backing of that, if I remember correctly, or there was some. No was backing. there a guarantee, or did there they... was no backing? So, but it was post bankruptcy. So it was post bankruptcy. All the prior liabilities would go away without a, a, a Fed banking, uh, without a Fed backing, and you end up in. I guess it's a fairly similar role at Barclays, right? How, yep. How similar was the transition? How smooth was that? Uh, it was quite a bumpy transition. Um, it's a pretty awkward position to be interviewing for your own job. Um, we had a fantastic franchise, right? Um, the, you know, the Lehman franchise was really known for research and for uh, was very, very strong in credit and uh, in the derivative space. And we were known for serving clients right within that space. And so um, that transition happened. Um, it was uh, messy as you can imagine. Um, but but also we, we kind of very quickly got back to work because there were opportunities in markets, clients needed advice in markets, um, and we needed to figure out what was gonna happen to the financial system. So Barclays had, if I'm, I'm sure I'm getting this wrong, they had a small US presence before the purchase Pretty limited U.S. purchase. And this gave them a fairly substantial footprint in the United States. Were there a lot of redundancies, or did you pretty much just pick up your whole corporate fixed income team and slot them into Barclays? Yeah, so so there was a, a good amount of redundancy. That had to be um, painful. Which was painful, but it was literally the fifth round of layoffs that we went through mm -hmm. at, at the time. And again, it, we said goodbye to a lot of really good people who, you know, th thankfully most of the people ended up landing well over time. Um, but it really told you a lot about the people that you worked with and how they, you know, operated and, you know, for, for me, it was definitely formative as a leader to be able to go through that difficult period of time to try to do my best to support my team and to serve my clients. It, it really looks like Barclays stole you guys, stole the, the crown jewels of Lehman Brothers post-bankruptcy when everybody was terrified, like, hey, we can't figure out what's going on there. Post-bankruptcy, the assumption is all the risk has attenuated and you're just left with search through the rubble of, of the collapse and here are some really spectacular assets, great teams, and a long history of making money. Um, uh, what was the experience like? What was the transition like to Barclays? Look, uh, you know, I think that it was surreal to go from one firm to another. Um, and it, it's an experience that 
most people won't have, right? It, literally in the same building, right? You just change the sign on the front door. In in the same building, although we moved around. Um, but, you know, it was real. But, you know, I think when you work in financial services, you're used to change. You're used to disruption, probably not at that scale <laughs> and at that speed. But, it, you know, the, the other thing I would tell you is that, you know, what the organization was able to accomplish – um, and what we as individuals learned from that experience was just like priceless. I mean, once you've been through an environment like that, everything else kind of pales by comparison. Right. You kind of wake up and, you know, um, you, you're able to deal with any sort of crisis, right? Like I, I'll contrast that with um, the the pandemic mm -hmm. where which was equally kind of a it was a much more massive crisis at both the personal level you know operational level but you know we'd been through crisis and i think for managers that have been through crisis have had to manage risk through crisis um that you, you get used to it you learn the lessons you're able to uh, roll them forward and it, and frankly it's one of the things that I think I do really well is in these periods of difficulty and crisis that you know I'm able to zoom out and understand how to deal with a crisis um, kind of slow things down get people to pull people together to communicate and to solve things um, as if there are problems that baptism of fire is unique um, to our generation I'm gonna Imagine the previous generation went through the 87 crash and the 2000 dot com implosion sort of was the bridge between the two. I'm curious, how long did it take before you were standing up that weekly credit call at Barclays that you used to do at Lehman Brothers? I, I think it was as soon as we were allowed to. Like, like a couple of months. Uh, it was more weeks. Oh, really? Yeah. And and you continued doing that at Barclays for for how long? Uh, it was about eighteen months until Alliance Bernstein uh, gave me a call and said, "Hey, we're looking for a head of credit. Any uh, interest in talking to us?" Huh. Re really, really quite fascinating. So, so what's the big takeaway from from that experience? We we've talked about innovation and culture. Now you bring up the issue of leadership. What did that entire experience leave you with? Yeah, so so look, I, I think there are a couple of different things that I took away. The the first and foremost is you take care of your people and you ta take care of your clients and everything else is going to take care of itself, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I think that that period of time for me, because I was very involved in working with the New York Fed, um, around what do we do to stabilize things mm -hmm. and provided, despite uh, having gone bankrupt, provided a lot of insight and ideas around actions that could be taken to really stabilize the U.S. financial system. Um, and for me, it was a calling around, um, you know, making sure that um, – I didn't just operate within an organization and with narrow goals, but rather that the importance that the financial system plays when it comes to the the U.S. economy and the strength of the nation is absolutely critical, and that we can't take that for granted. And you know, there's a higher calling for anyone that works in a seat like I do today, which is you have a responsibility to make sure that the country benefits from the work that you're doing. And so I've always, through that period of time, one of my biggest takeaways was any policymaker calls, I'm going to provide them the best advice I can, the best insights I can, so that they can do um, the best job they can for the U.S. economy. Um, and it's that economy that impacts so many people um, in the country, um, both their wealth, their well-being, um, as well as the country's national security. And I think that, you know, a lot of folks look at our industry and they question, you know, whether whether you know, why we exist, whether we need to exist. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, history has shown that the, um, you know, the, the ability to grow um, 
the country and invest in innovation and infrastructure is really subject to the ability to finance that infrastructure. And so one of the things I find amazing about working at Goldman Sachs is that that is very much our purpose, right? We're here to help fund, you know, uh, the, the growth in the economy. Um, you know, yes, we do that to, to make money as an organization, but ultimately that benefits um, so many people uh, from their you know, longer term kind of growth. So you mentioned um, you frequently were responding to various policymakers. I'm trying to remember, was, was Tim Geithner New York Fed chief when you were at yes. uh, Lehman, or did he come in afterwards? No, uh, Geithner was was uh, head of the New York Fed. So you must have had a lot of back and forth with him over that time. There were some people working both in the the Treasury Department and in the New York Fed and the Federal Reserve, clearly paying very close attention at that point to what was going on. Yeah, I, I, I spent more of my time with the New York Markets team, so Haley Boski and, mm-hmm. and her team. Um, because I was a technical uh, individual, right? Like I'm a market expert. I'm not a policy expert. Right. But but I would say that some of the work that I did ended up turning into some of the programs that the Fed actually launched, including uh, the TALF, where uh-huh. – um, you know, I can trace back through some of the books that have been written, including the one where I'm a small character, that you know some of the work I did turned into policy, uh, which was you know, reassuring to know that I did work that helped students get student loans through that period of time when banks weren't able to finance those loans. Huh. Really, really fascinating when everything was was frozen. Hey, the policymakers go to the experts because. They don't have that expertise. So let's talk a little bit about your role as a CIO. First, what is public investing? Are we referring to public stocks and bonds, or what What does this include? Yeah, it includes public stocks and bonds managed both fundamentally and through our quant business and in individual sleeves, as well as multi-asset portfolios. So multi-asset could be a hedge fund, or is that internal? Is that outside? It, it's all internally managed, mm-hmm. um, but it, it could include um, a hedge fund. It could include a more traditional mutual fund or an ETF. So prior to this role, you were co-CIO of fixed income at Goldman for a couple of years. First question, co-CIO always seems like that's challenging when there's multiple heads. How do you run as co-CIOs? Yeah, I, I, I would say rather than challenging, it's actually fantastic. Because really? Because you have a partner. Obviously, it takes effort when you have a partner. You have to invest in a relationship. You have to communicate and over-communicate. But it's fantastic what you can accomplish where you have different perspectives, different points of view, and the geographic and kind of resource span of two individuals. So my co-head um, and co-CIO, when... I, I was leading fixed income, sat in London. And because of that, we were able to cover more of our investment leaders, mm-hmm. gather more perspectives, wider set of perspectives on investing markets. He came from more of an emerging markets background. I have from more of a uh, de- developed market credit background. We mixed kind of macro and bottoms up and were able to do, I felt, a really good job. But it requires investing in the relationship. You have to make sure you're communicating all the time. Um, you're doing a lot of kind of weekend calls to make sure you're caught up. Um, but it can be quite powerful, and you know, it prevents you from missing things. Especially they're starting out six or eight hours ahead of us. You're ending a couple of hours after them. It, it, it allows pretty much almost uh, a full day of coverage that you wouldn't necessarily get if both of you are in New York or both of you in London. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about your your current role, CIO of public investing. That's kind of an unusual title. I don't know a lot of firms that break the world down that way. Tell us a little bit about the thinking behind public investing. Why did Goldman structure it that way? Yeah, so so we have a very large effort to invest in private assets uh, across credit and equity. 
in order to make sure that we were also investing in our public investment strategies, we felt it was important to kind of unify those strategies under public investing um, you know, structure. I think that when, when you think about and look at the evolution of public markets, there's a lot of change going on, and both from a trading perspective, a market structure perspective, you know, hedge funds, non-hedge funds, ETFs, passive, active. And in order to really leverage the capabilities we have from a data analytics perspective across all these strategies, we felt bringing these historically kind of completely independent strategies together to deliver better performance for clients made a lot of sense. Huh. That, that's really kind of intriguing as opposed to saying fixed income, public and private, equity, public and private. You guys are, are, are using the dividing line as public versus private, obviously very different asset classes and different structures. So I, I, I kind of get a better sense of, of that structure Tell us a little bit uh, about what is the day in the life of Goldman Sachs, Chief Investment Officer of Public Investing uh, for the Asset Management Group. What does that look like? Yeah, so I, I think like a lot of investors, like frankly, a lot of advisors, you know, I wake up every day, get in, and the first thing I'm looking at is markets and the prior day's worth of performance, mm -hmm. right? Performance is job one for any investor, and so that's exactly what I'm, I'm kind of focusing my time. And then from there, it's really going to go around three things that deliver performance over the long haul, which is people, process, and platform. Right. Say that again. People, process, platform. Okay, yep. got it. And people is obvious. Your investors, making sure you're checking in on them, um, investing in them, catching up with them on you know what they're focused on, what needs they have, what resources they need. Process, we're constantly doing performance and process reviews across our different strategies. And really the goal there is to make sure that our team members are learning from best practices across the entire platform and that we're bringing the insights across not just public, but public and private mm -hmm. um, into our portfolios and our portfolio decision making. The final thing really goes back to that story around in innovation, um, which is, I don't think it, you know a lot of asset managers out there are like, oh, we have systems, we've outsourced our systems. That's a good way to fall behind the evolution in the marketplace. If you look mm -hmm. at thing, innovations like what, what's happening in AI, the only way to keep up and deliver strong performance going forward um, is going to be to be investing in your data and analytics. And that requires a scale and a focus that very few CIOs actually put in. And so for, from my perspective, you know, all those things come together in delivering strong performance. But, it, but you know, I think the other dimension of this is that clients are looking for more than just a return number, mm -hmm. right? They're increasing looking for customization so that the returns match up with their needs and that they're delivered in a tax efficient manner um, and delivered customized specifically for them. And so when it comes to direct indexing, you know, when it comes to a SMA of munis and taxable fixed income, those are things that we're able to deliver with the, the quality of institutional uh, quality portfolio construction and insight, but all the way down, as I mentioned before, to a $100,000 minimum size. And we're able to kind of take all this knowledge, all this investment expertise, and really use it to solve client problems, which is the solutions dimension of our business. Hmm. Re really interesting. Your recent background was more credit and fixed income. Earlier in your career, a little more on the equity side, what's it like being responsible for the whole public um, investing side, especially given how much things have changed on the equity side? I gotta say, I have the best job in the world 
right? Um, I get to see every investment process, every investment decision. I get to in- interact with the smartest people that genuinely care about delivering performance to their clients and solving, helping their clients solve their problems. Like every day I wake up and I can't believe how lucky I am to be able to walk in and learn something new from my investors every single day. And and that, frankly, is one of the things I think differentiates our organization. Every organization has smart people, but the density of smart people and their, their humility and willingness to learn from each other and willingness to teach other people, um, and particularly newcomers, but even f- for me as a CIO, you know, one of the most senior people within the investment org, every day I'm learning from my team. And we keep coming back to culture, which you talked about earlier. How important is culture towards those sort of values? Look, culture is foundational. Um, You can't succeed without it. And every day we wake up, we ask ourselves what we can be doing to improve our culture, to continue to invest in our culture and our people, because that's the only way we keep up. This is a competitive environment, right? It's one of the most competitive games in the world is markets. And so if you're not always training to get better, you're going to fall behind. And we've seen plenty of players do that. Their performance wanes and, you know, suddenly you wake up, they've been gobbled up by someone else or, you know, they're out of business. So we mentioned that your focus is on public investing, but Goldman has a very substantial um, private uh, investing side where it's either private credit or private equity or... Um, a lot of different things that on the equity side as well on, uh, that are privates. How, how do you interact with your peers on the private side and how does that integrate into Goldman Sachs asset management in total? Yeah, so what, one of the cores to our culture, core values of our culture is around collaboration. And so on a regular basis, i.e. You know, weekly and monthly, um, we have collaboration across public and private investing where we share, again, with you know, with appropriate governance around it so that we're not sharing things we're not supposed to, but we share insights around what's going on in, in markets uh, for the benefit and broader benefit of our investment teams and ultimately our clients that we're investing on behalf of. So, so I, I, I would not be doing my job if I didn't ask you a few um, questions about stocks and bonds and especially some quotes of yours. Um, one thing that leapt out, uh, you had said late last year, I think 2024 is going to be the year of the bonds. Explain. Sure. So um, we had seen late late last year, really started, I think I, that quote was from either late October or early November. Um, we had seen kind of a steady pace of inflation coming down. So the Fed's hikes were working, the economy was normalizing, and we felt that rates were too high relative to what was necessary to continue to see inflation come down. I think in six weeks, of 2023, we ended up seeing the rally that we were hoping to see in 2024. That that was huge, and it was like the last couple of months of the year, just a giant 100 basis point move in, in yields, which is kind of unusual, isn't it? It's a reminder of when the coast is clear, everyone's going to go for yield, and mm-hmm. it's going to be too late. Right. And so, you know, since then, we've seen kind of the data... Um, revert a bit. Growth has been strong, which is good, right? We want growth to be strong, you know, for our overall portfolio. But inflation has ticked up a little bit. So it broke its, uh, its near term path. Every, every data point that we end up seeing kind of confirms that the long term trend is tier, still towards inflation normalizing. Mm-hmm. And so you know, our our ethos, our focus has been, look, you're going to get these periods of time of retracement. Um, you want to make sure you have room to add into those because you don't want to miss it because, you know, when inflation turns, it's going to turn quickly and everyone is going to jump in. That kind of reminds me of another quote of yours. The market still has runway. Explain what you mean by that. How much runway is left? 
we have been watching growth very carefully, as I mentioned. Central banks outside the U.S. are actually becoming more accommodative, with the exception of Japan. And underlying growth is actually looking pretty good and diverse, right? Economies are growing and companies are being very disciplined on the cost side, which is leading to earnings growth that's out outpacing kind of nominal growth. And so for those reasons, we do think that you know, equity markets have continued runway. Having said that, you know, the other thing we have realized is that parts of the market and, you know, particularly around technology and AI have run up so fast, right, that the risk return is setting up for potential for, um, for corrections. And so they're, you know, they're definitely ahead of themselves. And so there are these long term trends in places like Japan and India and, you know, a lot of value even in other parts of the market that we think represent you know, nearer and longer term opportunities to diversify your portfolio. And, and so we, one of the things we think a lot about is when something has gotten overdone, when it's crowded, right, how do you tilt out of that area and into places that are good, going to work for you either in the short term, in the long term. Um, and, we see that as material opportunities, particularly in India and Japan, um, that are going to be long term. And even more broadly in the industrial space when it comes to global equities. And um, let's talk about an area that's had some challenges. Uh, some of the treasury auctions have been pretty uh, mediocre over the past couple of sessions. You mentioned, hey, at a certain point, auction buyers just you know, shrug their shoulders at the whole process. Tell us your thinking about what's going on with treasury auctions. Yeah, so so I I think the comment was uh, more around, and it probably came from the fall, around we will get these times. The treasury has to auction off a lot, right? The deficit is quite large and structural. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent the curve doesn't represent value, it is going to cause auctions to tail. Right. The, this is not going to be the first time that we've seen it. And it's really critical for both the U.S. government, right, U.S. Treasury to focus on kind of managing its its liability side, as well as investors to be thinking about whether there's good value or not. I think that, you know, a lot of investors are very concerned about the long term stability of running deficits at the pace that we are. And that's going to require political solutions and choices um, over the coming years. A lot of this is tied to demographics, Social mm -hmm. Security, um, you know, Medicare, you know, and and frankly, these were things that we were looking at 30, 40 years ago when I was in school right. and are finally taking place, which is we're having the baby boomers retire and the fiscal you know, costs of that are now have to get charged the economy. And so I think in the near term, you know, we're in pretty good shape because duration does represent value on a real basis, right? And we are growing, which is a big, big deal to grow nominally, actually is a fantastic thing for our debt load. But it's something that we're going to have to be very focused on as debt investors, we talk a lot about within our fixed income org, debt sustainability, and the the types of things that would worry us. So when rates were zero, nobody really seemed to be worrying too much about debt. You had the usual suspects come out and say, oh, debt's unsustainable, but they've been saying that for, for forever. 525 basis points higher, suddenly, hey, the interest income on this is substantial. Is there any pressure on the Fed, despite a slight uptick in inflation, to say, hey, we got to bring uh, rates down a little bit just to make the fiscal side more sustainable? Or is that just not part of their charge? I don't think that's part of their charge. They do look to liquidity in treasury markets, which is absolutely critical. But I, I think with this level of debt and this cost of debt, if we don't grow, if growth slows down, it can slow down really hard. And that can cascade into a real problem for the Fed, which is employment. Hmm. 
Right. And so, you know, I think the Fed is watching very carefully the evolution of some of the the debt stacks where, you know, in commercial real estate, let's say, where rates are very high and it's impacting the value of that commercial real estate as it sits in the banking system and other financial institutions. And were that to become even more problematic and spill into growth and, you know, cause deflation then I think you would see, or disinflation, I think you would see the the Fed move pretty rapidly. Let me ask you one curveball question before we get to our favorite questions, which is, you're on the board of directors uh, for Minds Matter, a nonprofit uh, that focuses on helping to prepare young people from low-income families to to become ready for college. Tell us a little bit about the organization and, and how you got involved with them. I got involved with Minds Matter because I followed a girl that I really liked. She was volunteering every Saturday, and this May is going to be the 30th anniversary of me being married to that young woman. <laughs> um, so, you know, my wife uh, introduced me to Minds Matter. I've always cared about education as a path for people to be able to better themselves. And, you know, Minds Matter you know, serves over a thousand students in 14 cities across the country. It helps those students get into college. It helps them believe that they belong in college and succeed in college. And then it helps them um, post-college build the network that they need to to succeed in life. Huh, really, really interesting. All right, let's jump to our favorite questions that we ask all of our guests, starting with, who were some of your mentors who helped shape your career? Yeah, so th- three that stand out to me uh, early in my career, uh, Dr. Jeremy Siegel at, at the Wharton School, who I worked for three years, um, was just fantastic in terms of educating me, in terms of, frankly, feeding me with the, the pay he gave me. And uh, uh, you couldn't find a better person to learn about markets and uh and macro than than Dr. Siegel. And, and, and he's probably the person that got this inflation cycle more right than anybody else out there. When, when the first CARES Act passed, he was the first person saying, you realize how inflationary this fiscal stimulus is going to be. And everybody looked at him like he had two heads. Turned out to be dead right. He, he's he's such a fantastic individual. I I owe him a lot of my career success. So uh, others, the two others I would call out: Eddie Raha, who is my first trading boss, uh, ex Solomon Brothers trader, uh, is out there, and Duncan Hennis, who ran uh, markets at uh, at Bankers Trust, um, ended up being one of the CIOs at Soros Group. Um, you know, three kind of really early mentors, and then more more recently. You know, at um, and my former employer was uh, Peter Krauss for giving mm-hmm. me the opportunity. Learned a lot about leadership from from Peter, as well as Doug Peoples. Uh, learned a lot about investing and and uh, asset management from Doug. So really, really appreciative of of. Uh, there, there's a long, much longer list of people that I would love to shout out because uh, I've I've learned from pretty much everyone I've ever worked for. So let's talk about books. What are some of your favorites? What are you reading right now? I, I would say I read a lot outside of industry, but things that are going on. Um, and then I love me a good, like, you know, Navy SEAL that is going and taking down the terrorists and defending a country kind of book. So uh, in that genre, I read a lot of Brad Taylor, Brad Thor, Vince Flynn, you know, give me anything that's like a techno thriller and I'm there. When it comes to reading for for content, one of my favorite books I've read kind of more recently in the last 12 months has been Chip War. Mm -hmm. I think the history of the chip is amazing. The gene was like, eye-opening around you know, how genetics really works and there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of implications to investing and in the way you design investing systems particularly with AI uh, the hard thing about hard things by uh, Horowitz is a great um, kind of leadership and startup book and how to think about kind of running an organization um, and I'd also throw in that the latest Elon Musk book is is fantastic it's a really interesting read kind of an interesting 
personal dissection, but a great read around how to think about value engineering in a physical sense, not in a computer sense. Um, so, so those are those are a couple that uh, that's stand a good out. list. And our our final two questions: What sort of advice would you give to a recent college grad interested in a career in either investing or asset management? Yeah. So, so the first thing I'd tell you is read voraciously about markets and then build yourself a model portfolio um, because the best way to learn is to actually be doing things to use that to figure out your style um, and from a style investing style perspective read about other investors um, you know every investor has a tale of how they've lost money and the lessons they've learned through that um, it's a lot easier to learn from someone else's mistakes than from your own you'll make plenty of your own but like make sure you're reading about how others failed um, and and really try to get to the core of it not the the kind of polished version and and then the third thing I would uh, recommend them do is be process oriented right build a process say you know, be really conscious about how you're making decisions and why you're making decisions and what is going into each of those decisions. Hmm. And our final question, what do you know about the world of investing in asset management today you wish you knew 30 or so years ago when you were first getting started? I'd leave you with kind of three observations that um, strike me or you know, that, that have really kind of accumulated over the last 30 years. So three things. You know, the first is discipline works over smarts. Mm -hmm. So the smartest people lose the most money. <laughs> you know, the most disciplined people actually generate strong returns over time. The second thing is when in doubt, do what works over time. Don't try to time the market. Just, you know, be humble in what you understand about what's going on and then do what works over time because that's the highest likelihood you are to deliver returns. And then the final thing, you know, I wish I had learned this one earlier in life is that particularly as an individual investor, that if you don't think about after tax returns, uh -huh. when you're making investment decisions, you're missing the whole game. Is the highest hit ratio, the lowest cost that you will ever face is to really align your investing approach to be low, uh, to be tax efficient. And I think your taxes change over time, particularly given the fiscal situation. If you're earning good money, your taxes rates are likely to rise, mm -hmm. right? And you should be happy to pay them that you're, you're successful enough to pay them. But, you know, make sure you're investing your money through a if tax efficient lens. Huh. Really, really quite fascinating. Uh, Assis, thank you for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with Assis Shah, co-head and CIO of Public Investing at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. If you enjoy this conversation, well, check out any of the previous 500 or so we've done over the past nine and a half years. You can find those at iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Check out my new podcast, At The Money, short conversations with experts about your money, earning it, spending it, and most importantly, investing it. Find that in your Masters in Business feed or wherever you get your favorite podcast. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack staff that helps put these conversations together each week. Sarah Livesey is my audio engineer. Atika Valbrun is our project manager. Sean Russo is my researcher. Anna Luke is my producer. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio. <laughs> <laughs>